Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to advance in leadership, then this podcast is for you. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker, and Monique Marquez, senior corporate leader, ex-Googler, and diversity expert. From inspiring stories to cutting edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, I'm Monica Marquez, your host for today's episode. Have you ever felt stuck in a career but didn't know how to make a change? Do you wonder how to position yourself effectively for a future role? Our guest, Janet Van Yes, head of people at Cloudflare, shows how she changed careers by leveraging transferable skills and how you can do the same. Janet started out as a school teacher in Illinois with a dream to move into California. But when she finally got there, she realized she couldn't afford the cost of living as a teacher and had to work nights and weekends at a small internet company. She needed a long-term sustainable solution. And after exploring her options, she decided to pursue a career in HR. The only challenge? She had no training or experience in the field. In this episode, you'll learn the steps that Janet took to make a career change and how it helped her achieve her dreams and accelerate her success. Today, Janet leads the HR function at Cloudflare, including recruiting efforts. A veteran HR leader with over 20 years of experience in technology, Janet was the first vice president of HR at Twitter, as well as the company's vice president of diversity and inclusion. Janet is also the co-founder of TinLab, a venture seeking to transform the workplace, unleashing the power and potential of working parents. Visit imbeyondbarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources in this episode, including the best way to get in touch with Janet. Welcome, Janet. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. We are thrilled to have you here, and I know our listeners are going to learn a ton from our conversation. So without further ado, let's dive right in and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you've learned along your journey. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Monica. I'm so excited to be here. So my name is Janet Van Hees, and I am the Chief uh, People Officer at Cloudflare, which is an internet security company. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually been doing HR work in tech for 20 plus years. <laughs> uh, and so prior to Cloudflare, I was VP of HR at Twitter and VP of diversity inclusion there as well. And then before that, some smaller startups that got acquired um, um, by companies. By, first one got acquired by AOL, second one got acquired by Sony Pictures. So I've really spent my entire career in HR, in tech, and learned a lot of lessons along the way. Um, and kind of similar to I hear like a lot of folks that you have on this program, like I was also a former teacher. <laughs> so oh, fantastic. Yes. I started uh, my career as a middle school teacher in Illinois and all through college. My dream was to move to California and I was not shy about telling everyone I met that that is what I was going to do. Um, <laughs> And lo and behold, um, when it came time for student teaching, I got um, uh, involved with this really progressive, innovative middle, middle school. They were doing mm -hmm. like crazy awesome things and um, that I didn't even know was possible in public education. And so I stayed in Illinois for a few years as a middle school teacher. And then I finally moved out to California a few years later. And um and I was teaching during the day and working at an internet company um, at night, an internet wow. music company. My, um, it was very small. It was like the three founders and my boyfriend, now husband. Um, and so I was working with them on the nights and on the weekends. And I had this really defining moment one night when a group of friends um, and I went out to dinner mm -hmm. in San Francisco. And it was not fancy at all, but it was you know a dinner and you know probably had a few glasses of wine between the six or eight of us. And the bill came. Uh -huh. It was $60 a piece. And this is 1997. Right. Uh -huh. And I went to pay my $60 and thought to myself, that is my entire budget for food for the month. Oh, wow. And, dinner. Yes. and it felt like such a normal thing just to want to go out to dinner with your friends in the mm -hmm. city once or twice. And I realized as a teacher, I wasn't going to be able to afford that. You know, I had right. student loans and everything mm -hmm. else. You know, I came out to San Francisco with like fifty dollars in my pocket, <laughs> um, and so I realized I can't keep being a teacher. Mm. And I was really into the startup scene, the twenty-three-year-old CEO, and just the audacity and ambition of all that. I had no. It just 
it just blew my Midwestern mind. Mm. Um, and so, and then I realized I couldn't afford to keep my day job. So I had to do something else. So I asked everyone I knew, like, what should I do? I'm a teacher today and I want to get into the corporate world. Mm -hmm. And I got lots of advice that the best intersection was HR. Mm. Um, and so without really having like much of a paradigm of what HR was, I go to the CEO and I say, listen, we're growing. The company got funded. It was more than just mm -hmm. the five of us at that point. Um, and I was realizing they're hiring people who are qualified for the job. I was doing like customer support and marketing and QA. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, everything. It's one of those. It was so much uh -huh. fun. Um, and so I realized we're going to start, we're hiring people who are qualified for those jobs. So I better figure out what I want to do fast. And so I convinced the CEO to pay for me to go get my HR management certification. Wow. And it was okay. one of those programs like professionals do. So it takes like a year to maybe three years to get right. it done. Um, but I knew that if I didn't get it done quickly, they were going to hire someone else for that job. So I did it in a semester. So nights, weekends, I got it done. Wow. Um, and that started my career um, in HR. And that job was actually a really amazing first job because I was there when it was tiny. They got uh -huh. funded. They grew to about maybe 125, 150 um, when we got acquired by AOL in 1999. And then the dot-com bubble burst. Mm. And so then a few years later, I'm doing layoffs every few months. And right. that was a whole thing. Um, but I, it was a great first job because it was, I felt like it was almost cradle to grave for a business in your, like in your first job. So while mm -hmm. it was really rough, I had so many great lessons along the way. Mm -hmm. um, I felt really lucky for those experiences. And, um, you know, I, you asked like, what was one of the lessons? And one of the ones that was really critical to me is, um, you know, I don't know, for most folks, when you go through a merger and acquisition, mm -hmm. folks like me in g &A roles, right? I was an early you know, like right. HR generalist. Mm -hmm. You got made redundant. Right. And I was oblivious to that fact um, when, the, when the merger was happening. And, and I was so excited about this new role, new life. Um, and like, lo and behold, I got laid off. And I was so shocked. I was wow. so blindsided by it. I was put on a transition plan. I bawled my eyes out. Like I couldn't function. I had to go home and I was just mm -hmm. a mess. And, you know, lo and behold, we convinced the company in that time that my role was so important. We needed me to stay. So I ended up being able to stick around for a few more years, but I will never forget that feeling of hopelessness mm. and, um, and hopelessness and that someone else was making a decision that was so important to my life about where I worked, right? Mm -hmm. And my livelihood right? Um, and being robbed of that agency really made an impact on me. Mm -hmm. So fast forward a few years later, when we're doing layoffs, I remembered what it was mm -hmm. like to be on the other side of that table. And I, um, you know, and so I really made an effort to do each layoff one-on-one -on -one give them as much time as they needed. And then mm -hmm. anytime I'm in those situations where you're letting someone go, I try to make sure they have as much agency around what happens and mm -hmm. dignity throughout the whole process. And then as much as I can, like no surprises. Right. Um, and so, and I remember working with one of my former CEOs and we were letting someone go and it was really hard. And he said, well, Janet, this is really hard. And I said, yes. good, yes. it should be hard. If it ever gets easy, you need to quit because it right. should always be hard. Right. Absolutely. Um, so that one, that, that, that first job was a great one because it taught me a lot. That's fantastic. Talk about trial by fire. Um, you know, you do learn a lot. And, and I think the really phenomenal thing about like startups is that you wear a lot of hats. I mean, you know, in, in, you know, now you're at Cloudflare and you have like lots of different people within your team or your organization that are handling different bits and pieces, but you're the one <laughs> in this small th startup. So certainly I can imagine all of the experience that you gained. Can you share a little bit about, you mentioned, you know, the idea of when you got laid off and how you just were shocked by it and it, it you had that sense of failure and it was a setback. Like, you know, how do you, you know, share some tips on how you got over or how you continue to get over, you know, failures and setbacks as you move forward in your career? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to talk about the layoff thing first. I'll talk about fa failures in general because one of the things about layoffs is it's never really your fault, mm -hmm. right? And that's kind of the 
easy part and the hard part of layoff. Like it is no one's, it is not the fault of the person who's getting laid off that they right. are in the situation. Something happened to the business, mm-hmm. right? And either it was mismanaged or something happened externally that the business is not recovering from. Um, and so in a way that's an easy conversation to have to say it wasn't your fault, but it's still the end result right. is you, you don't have a job here anymore. Um, so, so I kind of look at those two things differently, but failures to me in general, I don't know if it's just me, uh, uh-huh. but I learned things the hard way. <laughs> so <laughs> I feel like I have learned way more lessons in the mistakes I've made and the failures than, um, and then in the successes, like in the successes, I could always, like I chalk it up to luck or something else. Right. Um, but the failures, I really like look and say, okay, what did you do um, that you can learn from? And so I know she, you know, HR, HR people get called cheesy all the time. I definitely get called <laughs> cheesy all the time. And I'm like, feedback is a gift. You know, yes. so what can I learn from it? And does it mean it doesn't hurt in the mm-hmm. moment or shock? And I've got to collect myself and be like, okay, take this in. There's something to learn from it. Um, I really, I really just try to learn from them, whether it's mm-hmm. like a small thing, like I sounded stupid in the meeting, or if it's a big thing, I stayed at a job longer than I should. I try to mm-hmm. take that and be like, okay, how, what can you learn from it? So mm-hmm. you're better next time. No, I love that. And I do, you know, I too say, you know, feedback is a gift and look at it as a gift. And sometimes though, when you do get the feedback, you're like, okay, this is a gift, maybe not one that I wanted, but it's certainly a gift. And what can I learn from it? I love that. Um, Now, you had this transition where you said you had this realization, you couldn't teach anymore because you knew that you wanted something bigger and better. And, um, and, and in some cases, like you said, you had a lot of potential. What, you know, transitions are hard. How did you identify like your strengths and, you know, your, you know, in order to those transferable skills that you could leverage and actually convince the CEO that you could do the HR job? I know. I'm so thankful for him. He really like put me on my path. Um, I actually love transitions and I actually am one of those people who, and I think it's because you said I was um, you know, kind of playing with fire, jumped in the deep end, whatever, how yeah, you uh-huh. describe my first job. I feel like every job I've taken has been that way. And either because it's by choice or force on me, I have um, taken breaks in between jobs um, mm-hmm. to kind of, because I tend to take pretty intense jobs and go at them, you know, like heads down. Um, So I want time to refill the well um, and get some perspective before I move Mm -hmm. on to the next thing. Um, And so I actually really love those transitions. But the the biggest one was probably when I left AOL because it was Mm -hmm. the thing that, you know, the moment that it became clear to me that I needed to move on. It had been, you know, like a rough year of constant layoffs. The business, mm-hmm. you know, d- the bubble was bursting. Business was not doing well. I was spending all my time in a plane between California and Dallas, Virginia and New York um, and was really unhappy. Um, and so, and then 9-11 happened with the terrorist mm-hmm. attack in New York. And it just, like most trauma does, it makes you reevaluate your life and what you're doing. I was like, okay, I've got to leave this job. It's not yes. healthy for me right now. And so I left and I thought, I'm done with HR. Like I'm done. Like that was a great, that was a great first job, but this is mm-hmm. not for me. Um, I'm going to do my second act. I'm going to start, like, I'm like, you could do whatever you want. Do you want to go back to school? Do you want to go like be a psychologist? Do you want to mm-hmm. go back to academia? Do you want to get your PhD? And mm-hmm. I had all these ideas. Um, and what, and I spent a lot of time thinking about it. And what it really came down to was like, I loved my job in HR. I really did love HR work. Mm-hmm. I just didn't love HR work when the company you know, was sinking shit, like right. it wasn't fun. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh-huh. And so I realized, okay, I loved the HR work and I particularly loved it in tech. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when I thought about, could you do HR work in retail or something that didn't excite me, but I loved like being around the innovators and, mm-hmm. you know, the entrepreneurs and like, or, and people who are saying to me, even as an HR person, do it different. Like mm-hmm. how else can we kind of innovate around right. HR. And I love that license. And it's not different than that middle school, right? That mm-hmm. I was teaching right. at, that I couldn't leave right away. Like they were doing something different. Um, and so I think I'm really attracted to that. And um, being in build mode, you know, I like to take something where there was nothing and build it. I like mm-hmm. that. Uh, that is my happy place. And even when I left Twitter, people said, oh, now are you going to do a big company? You know, like you've done this small startup, got big thing and taken up company public. And I thought, Oh God, I would wither on the vine. <laughs> that is not good for me. Uh-huh. Um, I see the appeal. Um, it's just 
I know where I get excited. Um, mm-hmm. and it's definitely in the building, like the, the build, build not, yes. not in the building, building it. <laughs> the building, yeah, laying the foundation. <laughs> yeah. Laying yeah. the foundation and building it and seeing it uh, come to fruition. I think that's so fulfilling and, and can understand the draw to it. Um, tell me a little bit about, because in that whole innovation, right? And you're going to these small startups and you are sometimes building things and doing it different. Like there's no benchmark sometimes. Do you, you know, do you ever struggle with, you know, just any kind of limiting beliefs or fears of like, what if I do it wrong? Or what if, you know, I decide to take a direction and it's not right? How do you manage that and how do you get through it? Um, every day I worry about that, um, <laughs> for sure. Uh, no, I, when I started at Twitter, it was 90 people mm-hmm. in one office in San Francisco and zero revenue, right? And I used to joke that I was hired for the job I was qualified for, right? And then mm-hmm. I blinked and it's 4,000 people and we're going through an IPO, right? And, uh-huh. and we're in 20 countries and there's $2 billion in revenue, you know, talk about being out in front of your skis for a long, yes. long time. And I actually stopped, I stopped saying out loud, oh, I was hired for the job I was qualified for because I realized as a woman, I was kind of, I felt like it was undermining kind of the work that I put in. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it was just, I don't know, I just said, I'm, I'm going to stop doing that. You know, mm-hmm. I'm going to take ownership for my six and a half seven years um, <laughs> um, building that company. Uh, and so um, so how do, how do I, how did I, for now, how do we deal with that? How do I deal with the setback? Yeah, the, the over, <laughs> like just fa- like limiting beliefs and any kind of fears as you were saying, oh, you're uh, in, you okay. know, out in front of your skis and how do you navigate? Yeah, and so I don't know that I did that very well in a healthy way for mm-hmm. some of my career. And I think some of it is the context that I was in, um, where I, yeah, where I did feel over my skis, and I felt like maybe, um, you know, that the environment itself wasn't one of like a, a learning organization or a growth mindset. Um, mm-hmm. So the mistakes did feel fatal. And I think mm-hmm. that I, I think if when I look back. I do not think that that was a healthy place for a long time, you know, Mm -hmm. from that I was living in mentally. Mm -hmm. Um, Now I, what I tried to do is, um, is call that inner critic out for what it is, right? It's sabotaging Mm -hmm. you. And and I'll say things like, okay, I'm getting really anxious about this board meeting or this comp committee meeting or this presentation or a press thing, a podcast. And you're like, okay, Mm -hmm. well, when have you ever really blown it? I'm like, I don't, I can't, I I don't think I've ever really blown it. And I'm like, then why do you act like you've blown it every time? (laughs) So I try to like face some facts to myself. Mm -hmm. Like, what Mm -hmm. are the facts here? Like, what would I say to a friend? Uh, And then honestly, I'm trying the whole spiritual practice thing. I'm not Mm -hmm. good at it, but I realize I'm 48 years old. I've had 48 years to like get through this whole thing intellectually. And I don't, I, there's some successes there and there's some that not. Mm-hmm. And so I'm trying to also approach it from like a spiritual point of view. Like, what can I learn through meditation and being in my heart? Um, and, and I'm trying that. I'm not good at it, but uh-huh. that's where I'm at. I love that. Yeah. I always, you know, in terms of the whole, sometimes the imposter syndrome or that inner critic, right. Is like, you know, I always remind myself, okay, this is a fear and fear stands for false evidence appearing real. And I'm like, what's the real evidence? I love that. False yes. evidence appearing. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can totally, <laughs> uh, you know, I usually run like, okay, the inner critic's going to be there. It just needs to take a back seat at the moment. So I uh, can totally understand how, mm-hmm. Um, especially in, like you said, in a startup, when you're in this role and it's growing so fast, it's like hockey stick growth. And like you said, you're kind of out in front of your skis and you've got to just try to be as agile and nimble as possible, but it's, it's, it can be scary. Um, in, in talking about that, how did you, you know, you mentioned earlier community and as you were kind of, as you were teaching, you were doing this kind of moonlighting and this, you know, startup, and then you leveraged your community, you leveraged your relationships to get opportunities. Um, how important has community been to you, especially going, you know, into these smaller organizations that could be very male dominated, not very many peers that you could, you know, lean on? Um, how did you navigate and how did you kind of leverage community? 
Yeah, great. No, that is, uh, well, and, and just relationship building in general is just a huge part of my work anyway, mm-hmm. of being an effective people leader. Um, but it's so true when I'm first starting, right? And so I think for me, uh, what, now when I look, now that you put it this way, I'm realizing what I always go on listening tours when I started mm-hmm. a company, right? Just mm-hmm. like, what's working? What do you like about being here? What should I know? Who's great that I should be talking to? Um, but I've always sought the woman, women in the company mm. because, you know, I tend to join companies when they're smaller and then hopefully they're on their way to get bigger. Um, and so I've always made an effort to meet them regardless if they weren't like my peer on the executive team or they weren't mm-hmm. on the people team. I wanted to know their story right. and what they liked about working there and what, um, you know, what maybe should be on my radar that isn't on other people's radar. Um, so I've always made an effort to, to find the women, um, or folks from underrepresented groups in the company, so I could know what was top of mind for them. That's been a priority mm-hmm. for me. Mm. Yeah, it's always so important to hear kind of almost what's, you know, what's going on uh, outside of the kind of, you know, you do your people surveys, you get this information, everybody says they're having fun. And then, you know, you get into these smaller focus groups and you realize they're not having the same experience. Let's really, truly understand it and figure out what's what's going on. I think that's fantastic. Well, um, and that's why employee resource groups have been so important for me mm-hmm. everywhere. I think Cloudflare does them better than anywhere I've been is um, because if you just listen to like the employee survey voice or the voice of the masses, you're not going to hear the underrepresented voices in there. Right. Right? They're just going to get drowned out by mm-hmm. the masses. They're literally, mm-hmm. by definition, they're underrepresented. Um, and so the employee resource groups have always been really important for me to like, okay, how are you thinking about this? How's the company doing in there? How can we be better? Mm-hmm. Um is this the right thing for us to be doing? Is this the wrong thing for us to be doing? Um, and so there, those groups have always been really instrumental, I think, to a strong people team and a strong company. Yes. Um, and so working at a company that really values that is very important. That's fantastic. So I do have a question for you. You mentioned, you know, it, you know, employee resource groups creating that community and that safe space for, you know, those underrepresented groups. Um, but one of the, you know, just in my career and working with various different uh, underrepresented groups, all the communities, um, ERGs at various organizations, I'd always get asked and personally would always get, you know, um, tons of requests to be mentors to kind of help sponsor uh, because there weren't a lot of individuals that looked like me or, you know, they wanted someone that looked like them. And my feedback was absolutely, but, you know, always encouraging them to seek out other mentors and sponsors that don't look like them. And so I'd love for you to share, you know, yourself, like who have been some of your biggest, you know, mentors and sponsors, uh, especially in these small startups where you may not have had individuals that looked like you that you could look up to and ask for, you know, advice. Interestingly, I don't feel like I've had a ton of mentors. Mm -hmm. Um, I, um, I, when I think about the people who have been there for me, it's the people who've reached out to me to be a mentor, right? And they're mm. like, they think I'm their mentor. I'm like, no, 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 you're my mentor. Okay. You know, because <laughs> yeah. I think that really, it really does end up being a two way street. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, I, get, I think the biggest surprise is okay, and I spent a bunch of years at Twitter. And so, of course, I know that platform well. I think there's lots of reasons to avoid it. Um, but I have really been kind of mentored and coached and guided by folks I follow on Twitter that I've never met. Mm. Um, And so, um, you know, just looking for people who either like think the way I do or think differently or are really in um, entrenched in research that I need to help kind of build my business case or make Mm -hmm. my point or, you know, kind of have different angles in order to reach the person where they're at. Um, So I, I think I'm more, you know, I I think I really leaned into the relationships with the people that I work with Mm -hmm. um, and then just try to find like really smart people mostly on Twitter that I get Mm -hmm. to learn from. I think that is such interesting and really sage advice because it's that perspective sometimes and that diversity of perspective that you find on platforms like Twitter, like LinkedIn and others where, um, you know, you can learn from lots of other people and, and, uh, you know, and I think now in the digital age too, I mean, it's, you know, and given post COVID, right. That we're all virtually, you know, there's, there's now new ways to connect. And I think, um, 
what you've brought up is actually something really insightful that I don't think maybe many people are leveraging. They're still thinking that mentor relationship needs to be that in-person live kind of, you know, exchange where there's probably a lot of information they can glean from doing what you do in terms of really connecting and following with people virtually. So I love yeah. that. I think that's yeah. something that I need to tap into myself. Never oh, really thought of it that way. I also like, I don't, you know, my husband, I talk about this a lot, like he'll, he, he thinks it's good manners to follow anyone who follows you. Uh-huh. And I don't do that. I will mm-hmm. do that. The person is a woman or someone of color. Uh-huh. Um, but I'm sorry, white men following me. Like you really have to be compelling to get your <laughs> voice in my timeline yes. um, because I really want more diverse. Like I'm, I'm very mindful of the diversity in my timeline mm-hmm. um, to make sure that the little bit of time I am spending on there, I'm getting, you know, what I want out of it, mm-hmm. which is, you know, just, People align with my values who are, you know, um, care about diversity and can help me make it better. That's that's so true. I, I I do the same thing too because I you know your your timeline is kind of an algorithm, right? Of everybody that you follow, I want to make sure that you're getting some meaningful content in there. Absolutely. What if you could pinpoint the invisible ceilings limiting your success? Imagine having clarity on your strengths and barriers so you can take action and gain unstoppable momentum to advance as a future ready leader. Well. That's exactly what the Beyond Barriers quiz will help you discover. You'll get your personalized score based on the 25 essential elements proven to accelerate success in the digital age, so you can understand what's holding you back and where to focus your efforts. The Beyond Barriers quiz is completely free and takes just a few minutes. Go to imbeyondbarriers.com slash quiz and take the quiz today. I do have a question in terms of you, you know, you have had, you know, really great experiences at different organizations and, you know, making that transition from one organization to the other, you talked about doing your listening tours and then you set these goals that you want to achieve, right? Within your first 90, 180, or even the first year. After you set those goals, what are some tips that you can share on how do you effectively execute on those things and make Mm -hmm. sure that you're successful? Yeah, I, I definitely have a lesson I learned along the way here. Um, yeah, I mean, most of the companies that I'm at are pretty high growth, or that's where I spent my career. I think Twitter was hyper growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cloudflare is high growth. Um, and and so, you know, I think that we maybe could have like a little bit of a three-year view, but for the most part, I'm kind of looking at 12-month chunks, you know, like mm-hmm. what do I need to get done this year? And so I start with my team um, when I have one and say, okay, fast forward end of 2021, what do we need to do in 2021 in order to feel like we had a successful year? Mm. And so I have us look towards the end of the year, kind of looking back on the year instead of like thinking today, what do I need to do? It's Mm -hmm. like, no, it's, we're ending the next year. What do we need to do to be successful? And then we look at the body of work and then break it into quarters, right? Mm -hmm. Then each quarter evaluate like what was a hit, what was a miss, Mm-hmm. Is the next quarter still on plan? What do we need to rejig? Or, you know, COVID happens. What does that change for us? Right. <laughs> Global pandemic. We might want to reevaluate our priorities for Q2. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so that's worked. But one of my biggest lessons, too, I learned um, early, and I just, I'll never forget this. So the things that, the, the mistakes you made, mm-hmm. there was something, I, I forget what the project was, but I was working on it and I was really like in my back cave, cranking out what I thought was going to be awesome. And I just like, unveiled it in the executive meeting. So for the first time ever, <laughs> Janet's <laughs> going to show you. And it just bombed, right? People had a ton of questions and it was a mess. Mm-hmm. And so now I, I never want to experience that feeling again. Mm. And so now by the time, if I'm presenting something new, a proposal, whatever, like 60 to 80% of the people in that room have already seen it, right? They've mm-hmm. seen it, they've weighed in, their fingerprints are on it. Uh-huh. And so it's like, it may seem like an unveiling to a few, but for the most part, I know that, okay, folks in the room are, are going to get behind this. Um, and yeah. that's been really valuable because so much people work is collaborative right. because um, because it touches everyone, mm-hmm. right? So it might be a people team's effort, but you know the engineers are going to have to live by it or the, the lawyers. Um, and so I've learned that you really need to spend the time, you know, getting buy-in and mm-hmm. influence um, from the people that are 
you know, are going to have to live with this with you. Right. Um, so why I thought like, I'm really smart and I'm doing this. And I'm working really hard. It's going to be awesome. Mm-hmm. It was a bomb. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. People are all going to, I'm going to let them see it, weigh in on it. Cause you know, everything's better when, mm-hmm. for me, when I get feedback from others, I'm always like, oh, I didn't think about it that way. Right. Diversity. Mm-hmm. Hello. Diversity. That perspective. Yeah. That yes. diversity of thought. And I think it's such great advice, right? Where you soft socialize it with other people before you unveil it, because like you said, they'll ask you all the questions before the, that meeting or that unveiling. And you, and if somebody else asks those questions, you're prepared to already answer it. So you kind of exactly. are prepared in that, in that situation, uh, which I think is really great advice. And I don't think a lot of people do enough of that um, soft socialization of, you know, just so that you can get buy-in and support. So at least you go in more confident knowing, okay, half the people in this room are going to get behind this and then help me push it over the finish line. So I think that's fantastic advice. Yeah. And there's sometimes I go in and I know, okay, these two people are still against it or think this is a bad idea, but at least I know the why and I'm Mm -hmm. able to address it. And I'll even say, hey, here's some of the discussion questions that have come up as I've been talking about this. And like, Mm -hmm. let's have a discussion in the room here. Mm -hmm. Um, And then hopefully, you know, their peers can help influence that. (laughs) Yes. So let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about, you know, you've had a successful career and would love for you to share some tips on maybe daily habits that Janet has or rituals that you do to kind of help keep fueling that career success. All right. I think there's two secrets for me here. Mm -hmm. One, the calendar. Like mm. if it's not in the calendar, it didn't happen. You know, like, you know, show me picture, pictures or it didn't happen. Like if it's yeah. not in the calendar, it doesn't happen in my life. So like my life gets calendared. Mm. Um, so that is my number one must, must, must. Number two, and thanks to the, you know, remote work of COVID now, um, I'm really able to just let this go uh, is my post-it addiction. So post-it. I have post-its. Okay. I have post-its everywhere next to my bed, in my bathroom, in the kitchen, all around Uh my desk here. And there are rainbow colors and different sizes. And when I have that like moment of clarity or this, like something, uh, jog, something jogs my memory that I didn't get done yet. I write it down on post-it. Um, and I mean, to the point where I've, so I have three daughters and the youngest is seven. And she recently was like, mommy, can you do this, you know, on Wednesday? And I said, sure. And I'll do that. And she goes, do you want to write it down on a post-it? (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, actually, that, don't forget. That actually is a great idea. Let, uh-huh. yeah, I should write that down. Um, and so I have them all around me right now. They're literally like up the wall in front of me. They're all around me. And some of them are like big ideas, like what uh-huh. are, something that um, you know I really want to be thinking about. Um, and it's you know not going to happen this week or next week, and maybe even not this year. But something I you know a big idea I have, or something that's really important, or just like the little stuff. Um, mm-hmm what do I need to do today? And, um, and mostly it's in my calendar. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll still put like, what are the three most important things that you need to do today when I post it? So then when I'm, I don't know, it, in, in between meetings or coming back from the bathroom or something, I look at that post it and say, Oh, you haven't done that thing yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and so even though it's in the calendar, I'll put it on there just in case, you know, things happen. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that calendar time comes and goes and that thing, that important thing wasn't done. Um, so Post-its, pretty rainbow post-its. Post-its all over the place, add some color, some vibrancy. That's amazing. And I'm sure, how do you feel when you can throw that post-it away? Oh, my pile of post-its at the end of some days. Oh, it's the best. (laughs) The best. Fantastic. Well, in, in your career, you've, you know, worked with a lot of you work with talent, right? And you see trends and things like that. And we are certainly very focused on helping women accelerate their success um, in their careers. What is one thing that you've seen as a trend over the course of your career that, you know, um, tends to hold women back that you're always, you know, when you see somebody doing that, when you see a young up and coming female talent, you know, doing that, you just want to shake them and say, no, 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 don't do this. Like what holds women back? That's a good question. Um, one of the things I, I think there's uh, two things I want to say, and mm-hmm. this is like first one can go for any any gender, but um, doing work that is important, right? Like get find some find a problem that no one else is solving or work that isn't being done that's important, and just be like I'm going to go do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that gets 
the right attention and gets visibility and like, mm-hmm. okay, you're like solving problems. Like I got plenty of people around me who point out the problems, right? Like people who are going in and being like, let me help solve this problem. That person gets noticed. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be advice for like all genders. Um, mm-hmm. You know, for women, I think, you know, one of, one of the things is um, tell people where you want to go. Like mm-hmm. tell your boss, yes. like, Hey, this is what I'm loving about this job. But my dream job is this thing over here. And it doesn't have to be on your team. It doesn't have to be at that company. Like I want to be CEO one day, um, or I want to start my own company and really have those career conversations. And don't wait until your manager asks you what's mm-hmm. your dream job or mm-hmm. like, just say like, Hey, in our next one-on-one, I want to have a career conversation, you know, and see what, it, what do you think? Um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, if this is my dream, what am I, what are the strengths I can build on? And what are the gaps I'm missing that I need to make sure I'm paying mm-hmm. attention to as, you know, I want to fill, you know, what, whether it's in this job or my next one. So I think not feeling like you don't have to wait for your manager to talk to you about it. And you say, Hey, like to, be in the driver's seat of your career. Like, mm-hmm. hey, I want to have this conversation with you and don't keep it a secret. Like, don't keep it a thing you just talk to your girlfriends with. Like, let people who can help you know. I think that's such great advice um, in terms of letting people know and then also having the clarity of what you want to be when you grow up, Why, right? And and so people know that and when you share your story, more people can help you get there. Um, yeah. But then you always know what your North Star is, right? And you can align the various different roles, projects, and things that you are doing to help you get there. I think that's such wonderful advice. So <clears throat> I think in closing, what you know, you you what would you say is the most important thing looking forward now that can help women accelerate their success, especially in the digital age and in organizations like you're in where there's high growth? What can they do to stay ahead? Yeah, I think maybe just because you said digital age, it makes me think like, I really think technology can be a force for good. Mm-hmm. Um, and when it's at its best, it can be used for connection. And so to find those people, whether it's LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever they are, smart mm-hmm. people, you know, doing things that you care about, um, you know, following them, getting a sense of the things that they're reading and att- things that they're attending and things they're interested in and find a way to connect and make that mm-hmm. connection. Um, I think that would be in a meaningful way. Like, I think it's kind of weird. People are like, Hey, you know, out of the blue, come, will you mentor me like that? And I don't mm-hmm. know them. I'm sure that was awkward email to send. And it's awkward email for me to receive. Uh-huh. When someone's like, Hey, I saw this thing on Twitter that you said, and I'm really interested in learning more about this. Or, um, I know that you used to work at this company and I actually want a job there. Can you help? Like when people are specific like that, I don't know. I feel like you really want to help. Absolutely. Until- That's such great advice. And and now everything's at your fingertips, but right. Know the ask, right? Before you reach until out, to ask. Hey, be, be my mentor, know the ask, what are you going to ask them? But then making that connection where there's a little bit of that relational, like, you know, I'm relating to you, it resonates and it moves forward. I think that's fantastic advice. Janet, thank you so much for participating on this podcast. You've left so many nuggets of just great information for our listeners. And I'm sure they're going to have, you know, they're going to have people wanting to reach out and follow you and listen to your perspective and more of your uh, great advice. How can people connect with you and get in contact with you? What's the best way? The best way is probably following me on Twitter, which is mm-hmm. at Janet VH. So J A N E T V as in Victor H as in happy. I'm short for Janet Van Heis. Um, that's probably the best way. Yeah. My email is like where things go to die. (laughs) Fantastic. So Twitter it is, we will all follow you and thank you again for giving us your time on the Beyond Barriers podcast. Thanks Monica. It's so good to be here. Thank you for listening to the Beyond Barriers podcast. There are thousands of podcasts out there and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and tell a friend about it and subscribe to get new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com where you'll find show notes, links, and the best way to connect with our guests. See you next episode.